Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is the second episode of our podcast. Every episode, Jesse will read from Time's Riddle, a story project that we're working on. After the reading, we will take a dive into the history behind the story. In the last chapter, the Swedish princess, Cecilia Vasa, is visiting Elizabeth's court. She decides that she deserves one of Elizabeth's ladies in waiting to serve her. The Marquis of Northampton has offered up Constance Stoner for the job. In this next chapter, Constance Stoner's advocate, Lady Clinton, has other ideas. You're up, Jessica. Chapter 2. Cecil House, Home of William and Mildred Cecil, in which Lady Elizabeth Clinton demands her will be done and Constance Stoner awaits her fate. To what purpose did she make such a bold entrance? Lady Elizabeth Clinton asked herself, even as she marched across the threshold of Cecil House, thrust her cloak at a groom, brushed through clusters of waiting merchants, and strode through the door of Lady Mildred Cecil's receiving room. She would gain nothing by championing Constance Stoner. Yet she must. The girl had served her dear friend, the Lady Marquess of Northampton, so well, with such selfless compassion. Even as the sick woman became confused, Lady Elizabeth winced to think of it. Such a woman as the Lady Marquess to be so reduced, fie, the gods were a cruel lot. And yet Constance Stoner never sought to turn it to her advantage. Elizabeth Clinton recalled with bitterness the other ladies who attended the Lady Marquess, how they feigned despair to avoid their dying mistress. Constance Stoner was formed of different stuff. That girl had never weepingly declared the heartbreak of her love for her mistress, or claimed a malady of the bowels at the sight of the suffering lady. All lies to escape the day's nursing. Indeed not. Constance had gotten on with providing ease and comfort for the final days. Lady Elizabeth's chest seized again at the memory. After it was all over and the plunderers came, Lady Elizabeth stood by as Constance had gone back to her family at Stoner House empty-handed. The memory preyed on her, and she determined to find Constance a good position. It was what the Lady Marquis would have desired. It had taken Elizabeth Clinton many delicately handled conversations to convince the Queen to take into her retinue a member of the recusant Catholic stoners. And by God, Lady Elizabeth fumed, she would not have this work wasted and see Constance carted off to the service of that ninny-hammer Swedish princess, Cecilia Vasa. Sitting behind an impressive oak table in an enormous chair, Lady Mildred underscored the power she wielded to all who sought her counsel. She pored over a ledger with two men in overworked style. Elizabeth Clinton had known Lady Mildred far too long to be impressed. She interrupted without a thought. Lady Elizabeth, you are upset. Lady Mildred nodded to a servant, and the merchants left some documents as they packed up, furtively bowing. You have thwarted me. Lady Elizabeth, you always have the Irish in mind. Anne Bacon admonished. My sister thinks of the prosperity of all. Elizabeth Clinton had not noticed that lackey sister of Mildred sitting there behind. She did not like Anne Bacon, and she knew that Anne Bacon disliked that she, Lady Elizabeth, was of the royal line of Ireland. They never wasted pleasantries. Speaking singularly to Mildred, Elizabeth Clinton said, Madam, you supported the Marquis of Northampton in his wish. He has told me of your plan to move Constance Stoner to Bedford House. I went to great trouble to have her placed with the Queen. To what end? Mildred asked evenly. Indeed, why waste such work on a family of papists? rejoined Anne. I am not judging Constance Stoner's soul, only her service to my friend the Lady Marquis, which was exceptional. The Stoner family are old gentry. Constance is well-born, whatever disfavour they have found with the Queen. Where there is support of Papists, is there not also sympathy? asked Lady Anne. Sister, your tread is heavy, Mildred said. Lady Elizabeth, the Swedish princess is a great expense to Her Majesty, who tires of the continual outlay. Her Grace views sending this stoner as a satisfaction for free. God rot it, thought Elizabeth Clinton. The Queen had already agreed, and to save money. The Tudor did not like to spend. She tried a different tact. Why, Constance? Another girl will do as well. Northampton put her forward. Northampton is a heart-sick donkey, you know as well as I, dear Lady Mildred. And I appeal to your sense of justice. You bore witness to the loyalty of Constance Stoner, and I wish to do her a good turn. Northampton's wishes are petty. Does he not want, above all things, to bed that Swedish chit? Why should you follow his will, and not mine? And yet I may do both, Mildred soothed. The Swedes will return home. I will speak favourably about Mistress Stoner to the Queen. We will turn this to your young friend's advantage. She is here already, waiting to see me. 
Constance lounged in a chair, feeling content with her feet tucked under the edge of a turkey carpet. She had been sitting for almost an hour, napping, daydreaming, and admiring paintings from her perch. She felt fortunate to have been sent on this errand. Eventually someone would appear with whatever message she was to convey back to Whitehall. In the meantime, she was happy to be idle. What luxury to bask in stillness close to the warm hearth, while her fellow maids of honour rushed about after the Queen as she willed them from one discipline to another, dancing, music, then hunting or hawking, diplomacy or ancient languages. Constance sank further into the pillow at her back. Banging the door open, a clash of young bucks stomped into the room, carrying quills and sheaves of parchment. Constance deduced these boys to be the wards of Lord William and Lady Mildred Cecil. What a waste! Their courtier fathers spent so much for an education with the great Lord William Cecil himself, yet they stuck the quills in their hair and threw balls of parchment at each other, as any village schoolboys might. Two of them wore great wealth on their backs, enough to be peers. A plain one with moppy red curls slid under the most bejeweled adolescent, swiping the stool he was about to sit on. Constance was amused from her corner as bejeweled complained, "'Get up, puking rats, Bane! Go shit yourself! You have shit yourself so much I cannot even see you!' Bejeweled collapsed down on the lap of Redhead. And yet Mistress Labois sees every bit of me. As if she would open her succulent legs for a second-rate student from Gray's Inn. Better to be at Gray's than a ward in this tomb. How many sermons from Lord Boastbreath William have you farted through this week? Redhead pushed, Bejeweled off. The others jumped onto the bench, shoulders touching and stretching their legs in front of them. Bejeweled fumed. Give me your seat he commanded one who had the little of a student rumple about him. Rumpled slouched down on the bench, expanding himself. Move over, butlickers, Bejeweled insisted. You're such a princess, said a young man with a dagger in his boot. I warrant a princess would have bigger muscles, said a pimply lad. Bejeweled puffed up. I have a big muscle, one to piss and fuck with. Who do you think I fucked last night who told me my shaft was twice the size of yours? Pardon me, Constance sang out. She should not have watched so long, but who could not? They were like an acting troupe. The boys turned and stood immediately. Constance tilted up her chin. These boys were going to tease her. She readied herself. She would not allow them to win. She dropped her most elegant curtsy. Forgive us, mistress, we did not see you, Bejeweled bowed. Pimply demanded, Are you a spy, sent to report if we're about our studies? Constance wanted to make a cutting answer, but before her wit yielded anything, Pimply decided... You are too nervous to be a spy, yet too lurking for honest business. This from Redhead. Constance tried to think of a waggish rhyme, something about how the boys were shirking even if she were lurking. Fie, such a bad quip would prove her adult. A muscle-bound youth loped into the room, sweaty with a tennis racket in hand. Hola, you pampered jades. Then seeing Constance. Gentlemen, whom are you hunting here? Look at you all facing this lady down. He bowed deeply. Mistress, do you speak? We are preparing her. She is here for a reckoning a la Mildred, Redhead said. The words stunned Constance. Hang it. How blind she had been. She had not been called to Cecil House to relay a message back to the Queen, but to have an audience with Lord William Cecil's wife. She must be in serious trouble. Did some loose tongue tell tales of her betrothal to Sir Charles Paget? Would she be next in the long line of young women the Queen dismissed because of duplicity? Yet she could not tell. She could not. It was not the time. Would she be sent back home in disgrace? You have terrified the girl, Tennis Racket said. She looks as if she were Daniel off to the lion's den. A page appeared and Constance followed, knowing the charge would bring her some relief, but then she must face the punishment. She had no choice. Bejeweled called after, Do not worry, mistress, our lioness makes swift work of her prey. Okay, there's so much fun history here. I think we should start by saying exactly what we mean by the terms lady-in-waiting and maid of honor. Oh, absolutely, because those jobs are a huge part of the story. Mm -hmm. And they have so much weight in this time period because Elizabeth's court is different from all the other courts. Because up until this point, the queen's household was second to the king's household. But with Elizabeth, there was only one royal household, the queen's and the women in it. Yes, and I actually feel like these women have been a little underrated. I mean, Elizabeth spent almost all her time with them. They, She had history with them. She was educated with them in Catherine Parr's household. She would have really had clear opinions about who was smart, who was thoughtful, who was savvy. She really relied on their counsel. I mean, 
I don't think they spent all their time sitting around thinking about who was handsome. You know? <laughs> but they did, those men. They did pad their legs. Yes, yeah, well, oh boy, <laughs> cod pieces and hose, no thank you. But. Being a maid of honor or a lady of waiting, it was a real job for mm-hmm. these aristocratic women. It's like the women now who go to Harvard. Or, yeah. You know, it wasn't only in the house of the queen. They worked at other high-ranking women's houses. It was sort of working your way up the corporate ladder. Yeah, and and these women, they were paid. They had rooms at court. I mean, they were there to advocate for their families, to gain influence and favor and the queen's ear. Yes, and they negotiated with incredibly powerful men, the high courtiers, the ambassadors. I mean, they controlled the access to the queen. And they were also happy to take a bribe now and then. Well, it was worth it for the ambassadors. These women were really influential. They they had the queen's ear, and that gave them a lot of power, even if it wasn't sort of institutionalized in the way that the men had power. Yes, it's interesting, because when you look at the jobs they actually did, dressing the queen, mm-hmm. her hair, taking care of her jewelry and clothes, it it could seem odd that such very, very rich women would want to do a modified version of the job of the ladies' maid. Right, yeah. In fact, I mean, the highest noble ladies, I don't think they were paid, and their main job was to keep the queen company. It just shows the importance of being near Elizabeth. Absolutely. They were expected to serve for life. Mm -hmm. There was nothing casual about it. And the queen's need came before their families. A lady-in-waiting would go home for her confinement or her pregnancies. And then she would return to court just as soon as the baby was settled with a nurse. It seems like it is just now. Like, if you're an ambitious woman who works, it's very hard to balance work and family. And, well, anyway, at Elizabeth's court, there were uh, about 12 ladies-in-waiting and maids of honor at any given time. And Elizabeth would call on other noble women to join her if there was a big event or uh, something like that where she wanted to show off how many women she could have around her. So let's talk about the people we meet in this chapter. So Lady Clinton was one of the Queen's ladies-in-waiting, very high up, quite powerful, and the Queen's friend for many years. Yes, so they were educated in Catherine Parr's household together, and also Lady Clinton had a famously close relationship with the Marchioness of Northampton before she died. Yes, who was at one time was considered more influential than Dudley on the Queen. Absolutely. Constance Stoner is mm-hmm. our only... Constance. F- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's our only... One of our only fictional characters. And, you know, I think she's in a position we can all understand. Getting an internship at Google or any great gig is a stroke of luck, no matter what your duties are. Right. She's excited to be close to the Queen. And just like now, it's the influence of someone else that gets her that job, Lady Clinton. I mean, Constance makes such a good impression on Lady Clinton. Lady Clinton decides to get her a position in the Queen's Court. Yes, in our story, Lady Clinton is just so affected. It's really out of loyalty to her friend that she helps Constance. Absolutely, right. And for Constance, though, it's a kind of you know transfer or relocation. Her mistress is dead, so if she's not moved to another household, she would have to return home. But she's not the kind of person who would ever think she could land at the Queen's court. Mm -hmm. So Lady Clinton does her a huge favor. And that's the kind of power that those ladies-in-waiting had, kind of like upper management. I mean, they, they can't tell the CEO what to do, but they can kind of finesse the situation and make things happen. Constance is a fictional character, but the Stoners, her family, are a real family. And they went through all the ups and downs of the religious changes. Yeah, being in and out. Actually, I went to their house in Oxfordshire, Stoner House. It's fantastic. There's a beautiful park there with all these deer. It's great. I'm extremely jealous that you got to do that. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay, so then you can recap the whole Tudor religious situation so it's clear. Well, clear-ish. Okay, so Henry VIII started his reign as a good Catholic, absolutely loyal to the Pope. Well, then during the whole Anne Boleyn... Uh, event. He broke away from the Pope and he made himself the head of the English church. But, you know, he never really considered himself a Protestant. But then Mm -hmm. Edward VI was a Protestant. So during his short reign, England was considered a Protestant country. Then under Mary Tudor, the Catholics were back in power and Mary was extremely loyal to the Pope. Then under Elizabeth, Catholicism was technically illegal 
But in the early part of her reign, there was tolerance for it. Yes, and Elizabeth was a very savvy person. Mm -hmm. When her sister Mary was queen, Elizabeth passed herself off as a bona fide Catholic. But then she took the throne and... Surprise! (laughs) She was not actually a Catholic. But in her usual style, she kind of kept everyone guessing. The only thing she was not was loyal to the Pope, as her sister Mary was. And she was definitely not a Puritan. No, absolutely not. But it was such a crazy religious whirlwind. I mean, one way this day, one way the next day. So under Elizabeth, the stoners were um, what was called recusants. Recusants were people who didn't attend the mandatory non-Catholic services. And for that, they were fined really heavily, and they lost land and uh, money, and also a lot of power and influence with the court. So one last thing before we say goodbye. We have the wards of Cecil House Mm -hmm. in this chapter. The hot young men. Influential men like William Cecil would take boys whose rich fathers had died into their household. This was a way that the Cecils made a great deal of money. Right. And it also was a way that William Cecil could have a lot of influence over some of the most powerful men in England. Right. The young men had to come from very high up families to be able to get a place with William Cecil at Cecil House. But I just want to give one minute to another character, Lady Anne Bacon, Lady Bacon, a real Tudor woman. Uh, she was Mildred's sister and the wife of Nicholas Bacon, one of England's, uh, one of Elizabeth's statesmen. And she was the mother of Sir Francis Bacon, the great scientist and philosopher who did not write Shakespeare, by the way. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. We do not have time to debunk every weird theory about who wrote Shakespeare's play. Okay, well, we'll <laughs> save that for another episode. And that is all we have time for today. Um, As always, we have more info over on our Facebook page. And remember to listen to the next episode of Time's Riddle. And more Tudor-minded talk. Bye-bye.